Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The research is clear. Parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed. We partner with child welfare experts to bring you evidence-based and research-driven information. Reframed host, Emily Moorhead, LPC, and guests strive to make an impact on our world by creating conversations about topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. Hi, and welcome back to season two of Reframed. My name is Emily Moorhead, and I have guest Lauren Labeth with me today, and we're going to talk about play. Lauren, tell me about yourself. Um, well, I call myself a misplaced Texan. I moved to Oklahoma about 12 years ago. Okay. Um, I went through multiple um, job thoughts, I guess, growing up. I thought I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher and realized I couldn't do big groups of little kids, but I could do one-on-one all the time. Mad respect for those kindergarten <laughs> teachers because yes. big groups of little people is hardcore. It's terrifying. <laughs> um, but one-on-one is great for me. So I... Uh, have my bachelor's and master's and license in social work and so I just kind of when I do something I guess I go overboard (laughs) and so I did all that um I found out I could work with kids and then I found out I could play as a job so um that's what I do I got my master's to play with play-doh and I love it and it's so much fun and I get to use my work um skills at home with my daughter and I and so it's really fun to just kind of like do things just naturally and just work with her and work with the kids at my office. That's cool it's balanced at home and at work that you get to use that education. So tell me about your training. When I was looking at your page to refer a family to you I thought this is what (laughs) we're looking for for therapists for Gladney families. Right. So tell me about your training and why you chose those roads. Um, Well, I did TBRI, so the Trust-Based Relational Intervention, because I do work with a lot of kids who've been touched by foster care and adoption. Um, So I did that initially, and I love the the skills that were learned in there. Um, But then I specifically went to TheraPlay. I had a supervisor that had done it and was like, this is magical. You need to go. Um, and going to therapy play training is very intense because you, yes, you're playing, mm-hmm. um, but you're playing, um, with people you've never met. Mm-hmm. And therapy play is very like experiential and very much in the moment and you're close contact with people. And so, um, you're, you know, singing twinkle, twinkle, little star to somebody you, it's like a 30 year old man yeah. and you're looking at him in the face and singing to him. Um, and so it's weird to do it in the moment, but at the same time, it's so, um, great for attachment. And so like, that's one thing that we wanted to look at because attachment with adoption and an attachment with foster care is such a huge piece. Mm-hmm. Um, we were like, how can we do this to where it'll work through the, the lifespan? So what I really love about their play is you can use it for infants mm-hmm. all the way up to like teenagers. I've used it in groups of adults. Um, and so it's, it speaks well across the ages. Um, and it's so easy. Like you don't have to have specific equipment and you don't have to have, um, all these extra pieces. Like you can grab a bag of cotton balls and there's 10 games you can play with your kids. Um, because it's about the experience and how you present the activity and how you complete the activity. And so just learning that. And so going to therapy play and doing that and going to the different, um, there's several levels. And so, um, in the second level, you learn more about doing it with kids with trauma and things along those lines. And so there's just so many pieces that are um, just so valuable. That's really neat. So I, with play, why is that important in attachment? And what, what does that feel and change in a family dynamic? So with play, um, a lot, there's, you know, there's quotes upon quotes about like children learn from play. Um, but if you think about it, it's just, it's so natural to children. Um, children just, they're so imaginative. They haven't had that um, broken in them. I, I mean, it sounds so harsh, but at the same time, it, it's true. Um, and so their brain is in this like constant state of like fight, fight or freeze. It's not in this state of just like, what am I need to doing? They're just free Mm -hmm. in that moment. So they're able to receive a lot more things than they would if they were like uncomfortable or in a, in a situation where they weren't sure what's happening. But with play, you can, you know, put in so many different 
lessons and concepts and something simple. So if you're trying to teach to follow directions, it's like play Simon Says. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying, you know, how many kids play like store or doctor or house or whatever, you can incorporate roles in a fun, engaging way that it doesn't seem like a shameful experience or an intense experience. It's just a fun learning experience. And so um, one of the big quotes that we use, I know Karen Purvis with TBRI says it, is in brain studies, it takes about 400 repetitions to learn a new skill. Mm -hmm. But when you incorporate play, it takes like 10 to 20. Wow. So it just like cuts it down drastically because you're, you're using a different part of your brain that can really um, just grab onto that and you learn it, you know? And so it's just like, it makes sense to do that for kids. Well, that makes sense to me because a lot of times we hear with discipline, like start with play. Right. And that is so hard for families. Oh my goodness. It's a total flip. Because you want to, you know, you want to react right. to the right. behavior. Um, but they say start with play, and so that makes sense with the repetition. Mm -hmm. They also tell you with, like, discipline you, when you have with kids, mm -hmm. you have about 12 words before their brain shuts off. Mm -hmm. And 12 words is not a lot. If you start to talk, you're like, I sound like a, I have to either talk like a caveman mm -hmm. or, you know, I only get half my sentence out. Sure. So if you're able to engage it. And it also, like takes that fear response away from the kids because it's like if you start to do um, discipline in a more correcting manner instead of connecting manner, mm -hmm. then um, that fear response kind of blocks what they can learn. Mm. Can you talk to me about the difference between those two, connecting and correcting? So you want to, if you connect with your kids first, um, before you correct, the, it takes away the defensiveness in the response. So it opens them up to be more responsive. So you wanna connect with your kids, make sure they feel safe mm -hmm. before you try to correct them. Because sometimes we come um, with like a level five response to a level two behavior just mm -hmm. because out of emotion. And so it's really, we wanna make sure we're connected and we have that attachment. And especially when you have a kid from trauma, um, they need to have, feel that they're safe because even if it's something very minuscule that's happened and you wanna respond very smallly at the same time, their experience just changed their brain and they can't, they don't see it as like, this is small. They're like, oh, I'm in trouble again. Um, and so it's just like, having that ability to connect first, usually you're able to correct those behaviors without even having to move into something more structured. Okay. Sometimes people see it as passive parenting. What's your thought on that? They do. But I think a lot of it is, it is a, it is a switch from the traditional um, parenting style. Um, but at the same time, it's, um, you have to kind of stand your gun, like stand your ground and say like, this is what's important. And I know like my kid's attachment is important. Um, and it's not that you're letting things slide and you're letting them get what they want. It's you're recognizing their need and you're listening to their voice um, and you're hearing that this is what they need. They don't need me to come down on them and correct them. They need me to say like, what do you need from me and how can we help you? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, it's a switch, yes, um, but it's also very worth it. Sometimes our, I hear in trainings from particularly dads and not to pick on dads, but oh, right. Typically, the response I've heard from dads is, I'm not playful. That doesn't feel, like, natural for me. Mm -hmm. Moms feel the same. You know, grandparents care. Other caregivers feel that way, too. Right. So what do you tell people if that isn't their natural response or their natural voice? Right. And so one thing I love about TheraPlay specifically is the parent is involved. It's not it's not the type of play therapy where you like send your kid and then you drop them off and you go wait in your car or in the lobby. Mm -hmm. um, you're in there with your child and you're learning to interact together. And I'm down there on the floor. It's on the floor. You sit on the floor. You take off your shoes. You get super comfy. Um, but like I'm there with you. And so um, it's and it's showing like this is what we do. Um, and so a lot of times we do start out like I'll be playing directly with the child. Um, and then the parent or grandparent will be watching and then it'll kind of like shift where I hand over the, like the skills to them. I say, so I'll model it for you, mm -hmm. but, then you're, but then it's you. Mm -hmm. Then you get to do it. And it's so great because they get to learn new skills too because, because of their childhood and their past, playing might not have been a big thing. And so it's like finding those um, places where they're comfortable and meeting them where they are and not saying like, you need to go home and play like six games and they're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so it's giving them tools as well. And that's one thing I like about being involved with the with the, the whole family in the sense of like, let me show you these tools mm -hmm. and let's do something you're comfortable with. So I'm not going to 
give you skills and give you things where you're uncomfortable yet, let's let's gradually get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, so people who are uncomfortable with play, they've uh, progressed into being some of the most playful people there are, but it takes them time. Sure. So. So what are some of the elements of play or some of the things that you're looking for with parents and children? Um, so a lot of it is attunement. And so like really um, seeing your kid and reading your kid and be able to read them. And so um, I don't know if you've ever like you have children. So like when you tickle your child, if they're ticklish and you know when their laugh like switches mm -hmm. to that like high pitch, like this is uncomfortable laugh. And so it's like listening for those things and so teaching those things to parents of being like okay it's not fun anymore but they don't have the words to tell you that and so just like listening to those things or paying attention to their cues mm -hmm. and so like with, with their play being so experiential it's like reading your child so if you're doing an activity and you can say like okay you know you're not feeling this you know not forcing them to do things that are uncomfortable but also teaching them to use their words when necessary so in their play there's not a lot of talking mm -hmm. um it's, it's it's not a lot of like coming in and saying what happened in the past week mm -hmm. um it's just being there in the moment and in the experience and learning to enjoy one another mm -hmm. um and learning to develop that attachment and um just nurture it in within the relationship i'm I love that, and I think it's so beautiful because it's just that presence with that child, right, right. which is such a gift to give them. Oh, definitely. I'm struggling with how that integrates with teens and adolescents who are way too cool for school. <laughs> what does that it look like? It is very different with teens and adolescents. Um, I, I've had teens come in and I say, let's do this activity, and they look at me like I'm an idiot. Yeah. And they're like, this is stupid. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you just have to kind of shift things because at the same time, um, especially kids from trauma, one thing you've, we've learned is their developmental age and their emotional age is a lot of times is younger than they actually are. Mm -hmm. um, and so kids from trauma, you know, they may be 13, but their emotional age may be eight you know and so some of the activities do seem a little, little juvenile sure. but at the same time it's like they have fun so there's different activities you can moderate like um what is the word moderate <laughs> i want to say moderate but that doesn't sound right um like that, shift to their yeah level. you can shift it to their level um and uh make it more adult mm -hmm. so you might not be um blowing bubbles at them and being like, pop this with your pinky. Mm -hmm. But you might shift it to where you say like, I'm gonna blow a bubble, let's see if you can like blow it back, like bubble volleyball. Yeah. Um, so it's got some challenge in it and it's got some like um, different skills in it or making a special handshake. Like they sound very juvenile, yeah. but most teens I've had, like they've actually really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and so like some of the nurturing activities with parents, like one of the big nurturing activities within their play is feeding your child. Mm -hmm. um, teens are not about to let their parents like feed them yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and so we've had to like shift that into something different. Um, and so it's just like taking care of them by like painting their nails if they're a girl or um, doing something for them. I have one mom that I was like, when she gets out of the shower, brush her hair for her, which I'm 30 years old and I still look like, mom, will you brush my hair when I go visit? Because it's just something that's so connecting and it's so just like letting yourself being taken care of. And so that's something like our kiddos need to learn is like, let me, let them take care of you. Especially if they had a trauma history. They oh, yeah. have not, not gotten that. And right. a lot of the research says, a lot of the behaviors we want to teach our kids brings them back mm -hmm. to that infancy phase. Right. And so those connecting principles of brushing their hair and taking care of their just yeah. physical body, mm -hmm. that feels good to them. It does. And, you know, in their play, they also often talk about how if trauma happened at an early age, there's some gaps in, like, their brain patterns. And so you have to go back and feel those before you can move forward. So you have to go back with those kind of juvenile um skills and juvenile games and juvenile um, tools but it's not to like insult anybody it's like hey we have to go fill in these gaps before we can move forward sure that totally makes sense to me and I think mm -hmm. it's validating to parents who may feel silly right but what you're doing is you're nurturing that brain right and that's what's so healing about it definitely what about our families like who have children from trauma are there things like tips or tricks that you would say do this when playing or like Watch out for this as a trigger with their trauma histories. 
So a lot of things is it's like you do have to look at that. You know, their play is very um, close proximity and there's a lot of touch and a lot of eye contact. So for kids with trauma, like you have to be mindful of that and you have to be mindful of how you introduce that. So you may have to change the game a little bit to where, you know, the eye contact isn't so intense at first or, you know, you practice, you gradually come to that point. And so you, you change it to where your kid is comfortable um, with touch, you know, it's what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you let the child do the, the initial um, touch kind of a thing. And so one of them is like um, putting lotion on their hands and just like rubbing lotion on their hands and talking to them and things like that. And so you're like, let the child do it first. Um, and that way, like they can kind of feel like what's supposed to happen mm -hmm. um, and be comfortable with that and be like, okay, I have a little control over this and giving them the permission to say like, this is not, I'm not comfortable with this, yeah. you know, and it's not saying like, we're going to do this activity and you're just going to like it. And, you know, it's just like, no, you know, you tell me where your point is. And that's a part of that attunement too, is like really paying attention. If you know your child's um, cues for when they're starting to feel uncomfortable or when they're starting to get triggered, you know, being mindful of that and being like, oh, you know, I see that we aren't very comfortable. Let's switch this activity or something like that. And them seeing that you recognize that and then you respect that is huge. It's almost teaching them body awareness too. Like, oh, yeah. oh your face made this, you know, grimace or mm -hmm. your body got tense. Definitely. That looks like you were uncomfortable. Right. And so it's able just to say, communicate that, that I see you um, and I'm going to do what you need. So tell me what some of your favorite um, activities are with a family when you're working with them. Um, I love anything. Uh, I love anything competitive with dads yeah. because I do tell dads, and again, not to knock dads, but they are just so competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so a big part of their play is challenging your child, but challenging them in a way where you like raise the bar, but you let them be successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, of course, if you're playing cotton ball hockey and blowing a cotton ball across this table, um, you're going to beat your four-year-old because you're a grown man. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, let them be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and it's simple things like that. Like, I love cotton ball hockey. There's one where you set a cup across the room and you're the whole family. Like, you take turns, like, spitting a tic-tac across the room into a cup. Mm -hmm. Like, sounds so bizarre. Um, and I always have to preface this with, like, this is only something we do in Miss Lauren's <laughs> office. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like that's if mom and dad say it's okay, we, you can do it other places, but this is only something we do here. And so it's just like just suspending the rules a little bit too, because like I cannot tell you how many kids when I take out a bottle of bubbles and they're like, you're going to blow those inside. And I'm just like, I am. And it's okay. Um, because different families have different rules and I respect that. And, but, and it's also communicating that with families like the, in my office, like it's okay mm -hmm. if we blow bubbles inside and we communicate with the kids of like, Hey, this is what goes on here. Like you can adapt. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. Yeah, yeah. You can adapt it to home um, and say like, let's play this game outside or let's do this. Um, but it's so fun just teaching such simple games yeah. to families of like, that's easily transferable to home. Um, and so it's like passing around a silly face or trying to make each other laugh or things like that, um, that are so easy, but so you get so much joy out of them. Yes. And I think just following your child's lead in that joy can oh, bring definitely. joy to that parent, even though it like might sound silly. Right. It can be really joyful. Right. So for families, just to be honest, like it's expensive to go to therapy. It is. It's expensive with your time and your money. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of families that think, why would I pay to play? Right. So what is your response on that? Um, with families like that, I think a lot of the times I, I talk to them about, hey, just really just try to give it a chance. One of my favorite families I've been seeing for gosh, two years. Cause they just like keep coming back. Cause they're like, when we first came, I mean, they were very blunt with me. They were like, when we first came, we thought you were crazy. <laughs> Cause they were, and I was like, well, you know, teach his own. And so, um, they were like, we thought you were crazy, but then we also saw the connection we had with our kids afterwards, after doing this for so many weeks. Um, and it, it is, it is, um, Therapy is expensive, um, and it does take time. It's not a quick change, and it's not a quick thing, but it's also just so, so valuable. And I'm just communicating, like, children learn through play, and this is how you're going to reach them. Um, and so, like, I can sit and talk to your child all day, but if you let me play with them, like, it's going to be so much more effective. But also, like, within their play, like, if you join in that play, like, 
we're moving even quicker then. You know, therapy is not meant to be a super long treatment process. Typical sessions, like a typical therapy treatment is probably around 15 to 18 sessions, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not in the grand scheme of like therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's just like, it is valuable in the sense of like, this is how your child learns and this is how we're going to reach them. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, and this is where you guys have a chance to really like, be in the moment with each other and enjoy each other and and learn each other and so your child's going to learn things about you you're going to get a chance to really just take joy in your child and then you're going to have some great tools for for home or for the car or for like the waiting room and doctor's offices that you can easily whip out and be like hey let's do this to pass the time um and so it's really cool to see that and with families, like, just carving out that, you know, hour right. or less to just sit with that child and be intentional in that play, I mean, that's such a gift to them. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And especially with families with multiple children, um, getting to have that one-on-one time with a child, you know, and we've, and I've actually seen it progress with some of my families that we do start with just one parent and one child. Um, and then it, it morphs into the whole family comes and it's chaos and it's a circus, but it's so wonderful to see them like all interacting together. And that one child who was potentially deemed as like the problem child early on, they get to take a leadership role within sessions and be like, I know these games. And let me show you these guys and let me share this with you. Um, So it's really cool because then they are able to build an attachment with siblings that might have been difficult earlier or um, be able to share things with them. And then they're able to find things they can do at home um, and do things together. And so it's like it, it spans into the whole family eventually, which is really cool to see. I wonder if, like, for families who are wondering if this investment, you know, is worth it, Mm -hmm. just knowing that there's connection through play, maybe it's not therapy, but maybe it's just having permission to be joyful and intentional in their time. I mean, that can be so powerful. And then if needed more, Mm -hmm. with more guidance and connection, obviously seeking out a professional like you that can guide them in that Mm -hmm. um, and give them permission for those moments, too. Definitely. Um, and it's great to give families that of just like, be silly, like just enjoy your child. You don't have to have, you know, this, everything's put together. Like it's okay to be silly. It's okay to like learn through playing. It's okay to learn through mistakes. And so it's just like, if you spill something, I am like the world's most clumsiest person and I have dropped so many groceries. I've dropped a watermelon in the middle of a grocery store and eggs and all the things. Um, and it's just like in those moments, I'm able to like laugh and play and teach my daughter I mean she's one Mm -hmm. but like show her like it's okay to mess up and this is how we can do things Mm -hmm. um but this is how we can um fix it and here's how we can be playful in that doing that you know not everything has to be like a intense schoolroom lesson it can be a fun I mean not not saying school is boring um but it's just like a playful lesson um in life and just learning through mistakes and learning through play um and just speaking to her in the way she she hears absolutely i love the quote play disarms fear and i think that's so much for our kids brains definitely lauren will you share some resources for our viewers some of your favorite books or connection materials for them right um anything by theraplay institute you can go to their website at theraplay.org um, they have a great um, book called Parenting the Theraplay Way, and it's like 200 activities you can do in there. Um, there's a great parenting book that they just came out with, and I can't tell you the title of it right now, um, it's but it's on their website. Their website. Okay. Um, and it, what's great is like books like that are so easily digestible. Um, sometimes you get books about therapy modalities and it's just so academic and you're like even if you've trained in it you're like I don't know what I just read Um, but it's something for parents and it's relatable and they can read it and be like that's my kid or I can do that Um, and so those two are some great ones there's a book called just it's called play Mm -hmm. um, by Dr. Stuart Brown he's the head of the National Play Institute Um, and it really talks about how like play has been some around forever and like the play personalities people have and about how it's essential in life like it's if it was on non-essential then you know it would have been gone by natural selection but like play is seen way long time ago and so it's really cool to see that um and I also read like the connected child by Karen like 
Karen Purvis. Um, she gives a lot of great tips on like how to connect with kids um, that calls into that connection piece. And so it's really good to see that. We'll link all of those in okay, our show yeah. notes so yeah. families can connect in. And how do families stay connected to you if someone was in your area and wanted to connect with your services? So I'm in Oklahoma and um, I they can go to my website. So laurenlabethllc.com um, or they can... Um, email me or call me. I'm pretty open. We'll put your contact information. Right, definitely. In the show too. <laughs> and then what about Theraplay? Is there a website that they could find a provider through? If you go to the Theraplay's website, so theraplay.org, at the very top there's a find a provider. Um, and you can go put in your state and your um, town and it has a list of providers. It has the level that they've been through in training. Um, and so if you're able to kind of look there and find somebody close to you. Um, and I've had people call me who say, you know, I'm not close to you, but do you know anybody this or some kind of thing? So it's really cool to be able for them to like go and find somebody. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for thank joining for us having today. Me. <laughs> thank you for joining us for another episode of Reframed. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to send us any questions or topics that you want to hear on our show, email us at podcast at gladney.org. Make sure to go home and play. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Reframed. Visit gladneyuniversity.org to access the show notes and learn about upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback, so please rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time.